questions. So fortunately for me, the very first night, even before I understood what this whole mindfulness thing was, you know, I kind of got the idea of self-compassion. The woman leading the group was talking about the importance of being, you know, kind and supportive toward yourself, just like you would be to a good friend, especially when you're going through a hard time, Mm -hmm. which I was. And so, you know, I tried it out. It's funny, it never even occurred to me that I could intentionally be warm and kind and supportive to myself the way I would be quite naturally to someone else. Welcome to the Woman Warriors podcast. You worry, I worry, we all do. If you're paying attention to the world today, there's a lot for women to feel worried and anxious about. As we explore the worries with curiosity and compassion, we learn to live more authentically and unleash the warrior within, someone who is strong, capable, and resilient, come what may. It's time to stop battling against yourself and start using your powers to meet everyday challenges with energy, purpose, and bravery. Now here's your host, Elizabeth Cush. Today's episode is brought to you by three invitations to come home to you. If you'd like to learn how to feel more at home in yourself, you can sign up for your free invitations at elizabethcushcoaching.com. Hi, and welcome back to the Woman Warriors podcast. I am so excited about this episode, episode 161 of the podcast, because today we have Kristen Neff on the podcast. She is, in my opinion, the guru of self-compassion, which If you're a listener on the podcast, you know how much I advocate for and believe in and talk about how important self-compassion is. And today she's going to be talking to us about her newest book, Fierce Self-Compassion, How Women Can Harness Kindness to Speak Up, Claim Their Power, and Thrive. I was fortunate enough to get a galley copy, an early copy to read before we interviewed, before we chatted. So I can tell you it's an awesome book. She shares some personal reflections as well as some guided practices to help women harness their fierce self-compassion. And this is a little bit longer conversation than usual for the podcast, but stay till the end because she's going to guide us herself and one of the practices to help us hone our fierce self-compassion skills. So hang in there. It's so great to have her here. As I said, this my self-compassion journey has been incredibly healing and such an important part of my personal work that to have Kristen here on the podcast, just one, meant a whole lot to me, and two, I'm very excited to be able to share this conversation with all of you. Kristen Neff is currently an associate professor of educational psychology at the University of Texas at Austin. She is a pioneer in the field of self-compassion research, conducting the first empirical studies on self-compassion almost 20 years ago. In addition, to writing numerous academic articles and book chapters on the topic, she is author of the book, Self-Compassion, The Proven Power of Being Kind to Yourself. In conjunction with her colleague, Dr. Chris Germer, she has developed an empirically supported training program called Mindful Self-Compassion, which is taught by thousands of teachers worldwide. And as I've mentioned here on the podcast, I was lucky enough to be a part of one of their workshops, which was totally amazing. Chris Germer and Kristen Neff co-authored the Mindful Self-Compassion Workbook and Teaching the Mindful Self-Compassion Program, a Guide for Professionals. Her newest work focuses on how to balance self-acceptance with the courage to make needed change. In June 2021, next month, she will publish Fierce Self-Compassion, How Women Can Harness Kindness to Speak Up, Claim Their Power, and Thrive. I'm so, so excited to share this conversation with you, so let's get started. 
Hi, Kristen, and welcome to the Woman Warriors podcast. Oh, hello. Thanks so much for having me. Oh, I'm really excited. And as I shared with you before we began recording, I talk a lot about self-compassion. So it's especially exciting for me to have you here on the podcast as you are a self-compassion, the self-compassion guru, as far as I'm concerned. (laughs) But there might be some listeners, as possible, who don't know who you are. So if you could share a little bit about yourself and really what started you on the journey of researching self-compassion. Yeah. So, right. So I'm an associate professor at University of Texas at Austin. So I am an academic researcher. I've you know, we've been researching self-compassion for almost 20 years now, believe it or not. It's been a long time. Wow. But primarily I'm a self-compassion practitioner. And I didn't come up with the idea. I actually learned about it at my last year of graduate school at, at a University of California at Berkeley back in the late 90s. I was a mess. I was a basket case. I had just gotten out of a divorce and it was a really messy divorce. And I was feeling a lot of like self-doubt and I was also feeling a lot of stress about, okay, six years for a PhD. There were no, I had no job interviews, no necessarily job prospects. (laughs) There was a lot of anxiety about, you know, what am I going to do with this degree? Am I going to be an overqualified cashier, right? (laughs) Right. And so I was was just feeling a lot of emotional turmoil. And so I'd heard that uh, mindfulness meditation was good for stress. And it was Berkeley, you know, so there was actually literally a group that taught meditation just down the street from where I lived. Yeah. And they practiced in the tradition of Thich Nhat Hanh, Mm. who's a Zen, Vietnamese Zen master, who talks a lot about self-compassion. So fortunately for me, the very first night, even before I understood what this whole mindfulness thing was, you know, I kind of got the idea of self-compassion. The woman leading the group was talking about the importance of being, you know, kind and supportive toward yourself, just like you would be to a good friend, especially when you're going through a hard time, Mm -hmm. which I was. And so, you know, I tried it out. It's funny, it never even occurred to me that I could intentionally be warm and kind and supportive to myself the way I would be quite naturally to someone else. Right. And I was just so immediately impressed by the huge difference it made. You know, my ability to kind of open up to what was happening, to cope with what was happening, not to feel so overwhelmed. I really, it made a huge difference in my ability to get through that tough time in my life. Mm. And so when I did get it, I did get a job, you know, at at the University of of Texas. And so I started doing research on it. And uh, and that's really been the majority of my life, but not not only research, but also more recently, I've been figuring out ways to teach people to be self-compassionate. It's not just that we know it's a good idea. There's actually concrete ways we can practice it. Yeah. Yeah. And I I participated in one of your five-day self-compassion retreats, you and Chris Chris Germer. Yeah. Yeah. Great. So you know it. Yes. Yes. And just, it's really watching and just being a part of the group was amazing, but uh-huh. feeling how much it can shift internally for me has yes. been life-changing. I, I mean, I don't, I don't say that lightly, but it really has, because as you said, we don't, especially as women, we don't yes. consider ourselves as a good friend. I mean, we don't treat ourselves that way, that we would treat almost everybody else nicer than we do ourselves. Yeah, that's right. And, and, and that's what the research shows as well, especially women. Women have an especially large gap between how they treat others and how they treat themselves. And like the vast majority of women are significantly more compassionate to others than they are to themselves. Yeah. So what we're trying to do is just have a little more balance. Mm. Yes. I'll share just a little snippet of a funny story. I did a presentation in front of probably a thousand people, maybe not that many, 700 people for around self-compassion, a local, it was kind of like a mini TEDx, but smaller. Uh And I had all my cue cards ready to go. And when I got up on stage, they'd gotten mixed up. And (laughs) so after the first slide, I looked down at my card for the next thing to talk about. And I had practiced it. It was something, it was like the end. So I had to, I was like, holy shit, what am I going to do now? And 
had to just take a little breath, give myself some compassion and say, you know what? I can do this. I know what this material is. I can, but it helped me in that moment, bring myself right. back to myself and not beat myself up for not being more organized. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> one, one of the things that's so good at is helping you in moments of making mistakes or, you know, failure in some way. Like for instance, we're teaching it to athletes now mm. because, you know, if you're, if you're playing it, you know, collegiate athletes, you're playing an important game and you miss that shot oh. and you beat yourself up then the game's over. Right. You know, so how do you rebound from these types of mistakes or missteps or failures? And the way you approach that makes all the difference in your ability to succeed and learn from what happened or at least to keep going. Yeah. And so it can be giving a talk or shooting baskets. You know, it's really the, the similar principle. The more we can support ourselves, be present with ourselves, help help ourselves. I mean, shame She's shaming yourself that moment. Oh, I'm so stupid. That would have just made you more derailed for oh, sure. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Yeah. It would have been terrifying. And yeah, yeah, I would have, yeah, probably stumbled through the whole thing. But yeah, yeah. Yeah. I was able to laugh about it and say, all right, Good. here I can practice this and move forward. Yeah. <laughs> so during the retreat that I, I spent with, you know, you and lots of other people, I guess it was two years ago. You had just, at least as far as I knew, it was my first hearing of you talking about this other aspect, the yin and yang of self-compassion, that there is this fierce side that for women can be incredibly important to cultivate. So I wondered if you could talk about what fierce self-compassion looks like, what that is, why that you feel like it's important to be talking about that, especially in your yeah. new book. Right. Yeah. And so, so for years I, st I started noticing that people really had a kind of one dimensional view of self-compassion. They were only thinking of kind of the nurturing, tender, gentle side of self-compassion, you know, giving yourself a break, accepting yourself. And that is an important part of self-compassion, right? Sometimes in order to alleviate our suffering. I mean, what is compassion? By definition, it's concern with the alleviation of suffering. Mm. And sometimes the way we need to do that is by being gentle, giving ourselves a break, accepting ourselves, you know, being warm. But actually that's not all there is to compassion, mm -hmm. right? So sometimes in order to alleviate our suffering, we need to take action. We need to change something. You know, maybe we are unconditionally okay, but our behavior isn't always, <laughs> or our situation isn't always, right? If we're in a bad relationship or some situation, mm -hmm. you know, taking action is also a really important part of self-compassion. Sometimes we need to be brave, yeah. you know, do things that are scary, draw boundaries, protect ourselves. All that's a really important part of self-compassion. And like I said, I call it the yin and yang, or you might say the fierce and the tender side, that, that these two sides of self-compassion, kind of action and acceptance. The, the really unproblematic thing, I think, for everyone in society is gender role socialization. Because if you think about it, and I start when I started looking into it, I just saw, unfortunately, these things have been gendered. Mm -hmm. So people who are raised as boys and men, they aren't allowed to be tender, right? They aren't allowed to get in touch with their more nurturing, warm side. There's a reason only 15% of any audience I speak at is men. Because it's like, oh, that's a girl thing, compassion. That's a soft thing. That's not for a manly man, you know? Mm. And it's a, it's a terrible shame because what we know from the research is this is an incredibly powerful source of, of emotional coping and resilience. You know, combat veterans who have more self-compassion, they're less likely to develop PTSD, for, inter, for instance. Yeah. And yeah. so men are really harmed by not having access to the tender side. But women are harmed because they aren't allowed to be fierce. Right. You know, women are allowed to be tender. Well, I should say for others, not for themselves. They're supposed to be self-sacrificing. So that's one way it's hard for a woman. Yeah. But then the other thing, if a woman like gets angry or really draws boundaries, people don't like her. She's, she, she's allowed to get angry to protect her children, mm -hmm. but not for herself. And, and so I like to use the metaphor of there's, there's the mothering energy of self-compassion. And then there's a fierce mama bear side of self-compassion, <laughs> right? Yeah. And normally they're both aimed outward, but you can also aim these energies inward. And so the reason I wrote the book just for women is because it would have been too complicated to say, well, for men, it works this way. And for women, it works the other way, <laughs> you know, and also I'm not a man. So what do I know? Yeah. Yeah. But I just, I really started noticing for a lot of my female friends, it's like, 
if there's something in the air, I actually opened the book that way. There's something in the air. Every woman I can talk to can feel it. And I think what's happening is we're realizing the old ways of gender role socialization that were supposed to be passive and just help people and things that led to like the Me Too movement. Oh, that's just the way men are. Like women are saying, uh-uh, that's not, that's not gonna work anymore. And part of to be able to make this move, it's already happening, but I think what these, these tools of fierce self-compassion are especially helpful for women because we understand the power of kindness. We aren't afraid of the power of kindness. You know, we're, we're kind of comfortable, but we know the power of love. Yeah, yeah. We've used it with others. And it's just kind of saying, but there's this other side that we equally need to develop to be able to, for love to have its full expression. And that's the fierce side of mm-hmm. love. Yeah. Well, and something you wrote I, I, at the very beginning of the book, I, I want to read because I feel like it kind of a, relates to what we're talking about here. Because I think too, we're, we're afraid, as you said, when we are fierce of the judgment or how we're going to be perceived. But the other side of that is you say here, you said, however, it's, it's actually agentic, I guess is the, how you pronounce it. Agentic. agentic. Yeah. So g- agentic, communal, yin, yang, fierce, tender, they're all kind of pointing to the same yeah. Duality. Yeah. But yeah. you say that that it's agentic, not communal, traits that predict mental health am- among women. Yes. That women who yes. can be firm and express themselves authentically are happier and more yes. satisfied. So I mean, it actually leads to more positive mental health when we can really truly advocate for ourselves in a more fierce yes. way. Yeah, absolutely. It's interesting. It's also those identic qualities that predict self-compassion levels, mm, <laughs> believe it or not, huh? because it means when you're agentic, when you can assert yourself and you can stand up for yourself, it's like saying my needs count. Yeah. And so women, unfortunately, we've been socialized that to think that people will only like us if we say yes to everyone, if we help them, we're meant to be nice. Mm. And that means sometimes we're afraid to stand up for ourselves or say no, because we don't want people to think we're not nice. Yeah. You know, but what what do we give away when we do that? You know, we give away our authenticity. We often drain ourselves. We often deplete ourselves. You know, and it's not a matter of the opposite extreme of therefore being selfish. You know, what my research shows is self-compassionate women, they can compromise. It's like they don't subordinate themselves, but they don't, they aren't selfish either. Right. It's like, well, how can we come to a compromise solution that meets everyone's needs? And it's actually a much healthier healthier way of being. Mm-hmm. Also for men, I mean, it's all about balance, right? You know, so too much tenderness without any fierceness becomes kind of complacency. You know, that's not good that we can't be complacent. Look at the world around us. There's a lot that needs to be done. On that the other hand, too much fact. fierceness without enough tenderness leads to like hostility and aggression. And in some ways, I think because men have been running the show mm. and they haven't been allowed to access that tender side, Again, look at the world around us, look at the problems in our world. So everyone really needs to find this balanced integration of both. And so it's kind of a a little bit of a revolutionary act because you have to be willing to stand up to some of these gender role norms. But what what you gain from it is authenticity, power, love. I mean, there's a lot of benefits. Yes, (laughs) yes. Well, and you also aren't so dependent on other people liking you because you can like yourself with self-compassion. You can you can give yourself what you you know we, we just are dependent on others those, to meet those needs, and it gives us a lot of freedom. Yeah. Well, one thing I know that you mention in your trainings in this book, your newest book, and in other works I've read that you've put out there, that often what can happen too, when we do start giving ourselves that compassion, that there can be that backdraft where we're recognizing that there were a lot of times when we weren't given the compassion that we needed. Yes. And I think I will just speak for myself. What has helped me personally heal through the self-compassion journey is recognizing that even though I didn't get what I needed then, I yeah. know how to give it to myself now. Yes. And that's exactly. hugely healing. It's, yeah, it's huge. I mean, uh, you have the ability almost like reparenting yourself. Yes. Right? Yes. Um, and, and people can, you know, it's so it's true. People who, you know, whose parents didn't meet their needs or, or worse or very critical or even abusive, it can be harder to have self compassion as an adult kind of naturally because 
you, there was a model for you. You weren't made to believe that your needs were worthy of being met. Maybe you were taught that criticism is a good thing and mm-hmm. you should be self-critical. And so it can be harder, right? If it wasn't modeled for you, yeah. but you aren't, it's not, you aren't dependent on it, you know? So luckily what self-compassion can do is you can help heal from some of those wounds of not getting the early childhood that you really would have liked to have had. Right. You know, from those things and start to give yourself what you didn't get as a child. Yes. Um, so it's very, it's very, very powerful. It really um, is. It just, yeah. well, and I know that there are sort of components to both the more tender self-compassion and the yeah. fierce self-compassion. And to me, that really resonated when you explained that in the book. So uh-huh. Could you talk about what those components are for both of them? Oh, well, right. Yeah. So, so self compassion is, yeah, it's kind of, it's kind of um, multifaceted. So, in my model, and, and, you know, people talk about it in a different way, but the way, the way it's conceptualized self compassion, there's really three main components. So, we've been talking about the kindness part of it, which in many ways is the most obvious, but there are two other elements that are equally important. The first is actually mindfulness. I mean, there's a reason I think self, self-compassion self came out from a mindfulness class I took because mindfulness is really the foundation. Mindfulness is our ability to be with and to acknowledge what is. Mm-hmm. <laughs> mm-hmm. And you think about it, often when what is is painful, like a feeling of failure or inadequacy or you know some unpleasant truth, We'd rather not face it. So we do two things. Either we stick our head in the sand and we ignore it, we you shove it down. And I think a lot of people with our pain, it's like, I'm just going to stiff up a little bit, you know, power through. I'm not going to acknowledge it. Yep. And when you do that, then you're, you're, you're cutting yourself off from your ability to help. It's like, imagine if a friend said, hey, Elizabeth, I really need your help. You're like, no, I'm too busy. I can't be bothered. <laughs> you know, it's like, well, okay. You can do that, but you can't really help your friend. So we cut ourselves off from our own ability to help ourselves. The other extreme, though, the reason that we need to be mindful, and it's not like just being aware of, because if we go the other extreme and we be confused with our emotions, like we confuse with our fear or anxiety or our emotional distress, then what happens if we're fused with it is we have no perspective. We have no space, which we actually need. Self-compassion is actually a type of perspective taking. We're mm-hmm. treating ourselves the way we might normally treat someone we cared about. Yeah. So we take some perspective. We say, well, I'm having a really hard time. What can I do to help? And so when we do that, instead of being lost in what's happening, like lost in the worry, you say, hmm, I'm, re- I'm really feeling, you know, go back to your title. I'm really feeling worried. Mm-hmm. What can I do to help myself in this moment? And so that's why the mindfulness is kind of the foundation. We need a way of approaching our emotions that's balanced, that's healthy. Mm -hmm. And then also really, really important is a sense of humanity, a sense of uh, connectedness with other people. Compassion actually is a connected way of being. And like pity, you know, pity, you may feel sorry for someone, but you feel no connection to them. You feel like you're looking down on them. Mm -hmm. Compassion is like, hey, I've been there. Same with self-compassion, right? So self-pity is woe is me. It's very isolated feeling. It's very self-focused. Self-compassion is like, hey, well, whoever said as a human, you were supposed to get it right all the time. That's not what being human is about. <laughs> we're imperfect. We get it wrong. Stuff happens. And more than that, that's how we learn. Yeah. You know, and then, but we often forget that. We think like something has gone wrong mm. because I'm not perfect or I failed or something's difficult in my life. And then that makes us feel isolated and that adds insult to injury because not only are we suffering, we're feeling all alone and it makes it that much worse. Yeah. And so with compassion, we just remember, hey, this is it's, nothing's wrong with me for making a mistake. Nothing's wrong with me for failing or getting this diagnosis. Or whatever. This is actually what human beings go through. And when we remember that, when we remember our connectedness, then we don't feel so alone. And that's one of the things that strengthens us with self-compassion. Yeah, yeah. So, so important to, to be able to, at least for me, to be able to also be more compassionate towards others is in terms of, I can recognize that I'm suffering, but I'm not alone in that helps me recognize that. Yeah. There's a lot of other people that struggle too. And can I have compassion for them as well? Yeah. So like self-compassion is linked to, for instance, more perspective taking and more forgiveness of others. So the more it flows inward, the more it can flow outward. And so how is fierce self-compassion, the components of that different or the elements? Of right. That okay. So you've got this. So 
I've got this whole lovely <laughs> four, by four, four by three table in my book and it's a little, a little overwhelming, but I'm kind of a science nerd. So I, I like it. <laughs> so you've got, you've got kindness, common humanity and mindfulness and they, and they feel different in their different expressions. So it, it, tenderness with tender self-compassion, it feels like loving connected presence. It's really good to kind of sum up. What does it feel like when I'm mindful of my pain? I, I remember my common humanity and I'm kind to myself. Well, it feels like loving, connected presence. But if your goal is actually to stand up for yourself or protect yourself, kind of mama bear, um, kindness, you know, the loving actually manifests as being brave. It like gives you courage. Mm. And, and the connectedness actually makes us feel empowered. when We realize we aren't alone. That's why it's me too. Black Lives Matter. It's like these collective action movements. It's yeah. common humanity that's joining together is actually empowering. And then mindfulness, when you're protecting yourself, is like clarity. Like, hey, this is not okay. I can see it and I can say it <laughs> as opposed to pretending it's not there, mm. right? So that's some protection. You know, I won't go through all of it, but just, just to kind of give you one more example, a motivation, for instance, kindness manifests as encouragement, right? So kindness can partly be, yeah, I love you just the way you are, but I'm really going to encourage you to change because what you're doing isn't so helpful. You know, that's, yeah. it's not compassionate to say, oh, that's fine. You don't need to bother trying to change if what you're doing is harmful. Yeah. Of course I want you to change what the parent will with their child. And then the, the connectedness is actually the wisdom. So part of seeing connectedness, I've seen our humanity is like the ability to learn from our mistakes, understanding, well, this is human. This is how humans learn. You know, what can I, can I see all the causes and conditions that came together to lead to this outcome so that I can understand how I can do things differently. Right. And then, and then the mindfulness in this case is kind of the vision to be able to see what's possible. So um, yeah, each, each way that, these are expressed or different. And I, I identify three forms of fierce self-compassion, protecting, providing, and motivating. There, there are probably more. I just didn't go into them. But, you know, many images in Buddhism of compassion are of a many-armed goddess. Yeah, you know, right? Got many, Kali. many arms. Each yeah. one has a different tool and instrument mm -hmm. because how we alleviate our suffering just depends on what's happening. You, so you want as many tools in your toolbox as possible to help. Yeah. I love that, you know, what you're advocating for in your book, Fierce Self-Compassion, how women can harness kindness to speak up and claim their power and thrive. But it's not just about our own power, right? I mean, this is about yeah. a collective power of saying, again, like me too, or no more or whatever Ab it is. Yeah, Ab absolutely. I mean, that's the thing. So for the action side of compassion, it can be aimed internally, but also externally, mm. right? So I, I think of social justice movements, whether again, it's Black Lives Matter or Me Too, or, you know, people trying to fix a broken healthcare system, all these, or the global warming, you know, uh, environmental activists. Mm -hmm. These are actually self-compassion movements because we are part of the larger whole, you know? And so in some ways, the idea of self or other compassion almost breaks down because when you think of yourself as part of society, you know, we, we need to make changes as part of compassion. It's not okay just to sit on your meditation cushion and maybe you're happy, but the world's <laughs> going to hell in a handbasket. You know, that's not, that's not very helpful. We <laughs> right. actually have to do something. And this is also where fierce self-compassion comes in or to the fierce side of compassion. It, it can activate it as it can energize us. It's a powerful energy mm. and, and we need bravery. I mean, we're up against steep odds. Yes. You know, patriarchy, patriarchy is still alive and well. Look at, you know, the, the people, still so many more men in power and politics and at the top, you know, CEO level. Yep. It's, it's still so unbalanced. And around the world, I mean, it's, it's even worse, gender inequality, mm -hmm. um, racial inequality. I mean, it just there's global warming. I mean, you think about it, when you start to think about it, it the, pro the problem gets overwhelming, which is why we need that bravery, because it's like, okay, this is a big task. Well, I need some energy to try to do my best. And I need to give up the illusion of control. Mm -hmm. I'm probably going to get it wrong. I probably won't totally succeed, but I'm going to try my best. So you try your best. Here's the great thing. You can, you can go back and forth between the fierce and the tender. You fail. You make a mistake, oh, give yourself tender acceptance. And then you try again, right? Yeah. Or to replenish yourself. How do, you, how do you refill your batteries? It's exhausting doing social justice work. 
So you also need some tender self-compassion to soothe and comfort yourself and kind of give refill your emotional resources. So we, we always need both. One without the other is incomplete. And they're always like in this dialectic. And my, my last, the last chapter of my book, I, I title it, I'm being a compassionate mess. Yes, yes. <laughs> because it's like, you know, it's not like we get it all together. It's not like you develop fierce self-compassion and you have it, or you develop tender and you have it. And like, then you're all together. I would love to be able to say after 25 years of practice that I had it all together. <laughs> I don't. <laughs> You know, but what, what I do have is I am a compassionate mess. I'm still a mess, but it really your, your goal will start changing your goal. Instead of getting it right, your goal is simply to open your heart, mm. you know, and if whatever happens, you just, the way you relate to whatever happens is with kindness, you know, with courage, with open heartedness, then in a way you have achieved your goal and it, it's a process. It's not like a destination. You get there, then you're done. That is just so, so true. And I think something that I try to relate to all my clients being a therapist that I turned 60 last year and I'm still figuring it out, like all of it, you know, my trauma, (laughs) my, yeah. And sure, I'm further along in my journey, but to me, even with self-compassion and whatever the healing is, the journey continues as you grow and learn and yeah, open your heart. Yeah. Mm. And, and But at the end of the day, that, it, that becomes more important than the goal or destination. It's really how, how are you, how are you relating to the journey? Right. And if you can do that with love, then that's really all you need. You know, love is all you need. That's a great title for a song. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's, it's, it, I mean, the funny thing is, is I kind of joke, none of these things in my book are actually, none of them are really original ideas. I mean, all these ideas are ancient in many ways. Yeah. They're just kind of putting them together in a new way that perhaps makes it a little easier to understand or to access. Mm-hmm. This is all old stuff. Yeah. Really. Yeah. But again, you know, it's old stuff, but the, the issues and struggles yeah. still continue, right? They do. That, they that, do. As you yeah. said, like we are still stuck in a very patriarchal here we in the are. U.S. society that yeah. is, has a lot of... <laughs> it's, it's still... It's, it's entrenched. It's, it's entrenched. Well, yeah. So one of the things, I also have a, a, a chapter there on relationships, you know, so here I am, I'm, I'm divorced, I'm single, I'm 54. And I know a lot of women are in a similar position. I am. Mm-hmm. And, you know, even though I've, I've got a great career, I've got a great child, I've got so much going for me. I had to really confront head on that. It's so interesting. It's, it's transgenerational. It's in our mothers and our grandmothers for generations that a woman without a man is less valuable. There's, there's this some part of our psyche that still yeah. needs to believe that we have to have a man to be valuable, mm-hmm. you know? And again, it's not a logical thing. It's an emotional thing. Men don't have that. Men also want relationships, but they don't have that like deep seated feeling that they need to be in a relationship to be valuable the way women do because in the past we couldn't own property we couldn't you know we had we had no power whatsoever we couldn't even vote yeah so it's a very old thing so you know that's another area where it really really helps this fierce self-compassion this idea that you know obviously I want someone and by the way you know I'm, I'm totally open to a relationship <laughs> if one comes my way yeah but yeah. I don't, I'm not going to let my happiness depend on it. Right. And that's something that I think women, we're, we're going to have to do it consciously because so much of this, I mean, this comes from like a lifetime of seeing movies and, you know, the oh. songs we hear and all these things. It's so entrenched. Yes. And even the people who are in good relationships, and there are some, and they do exist, maybe not quite as many as I would hope. Mm-hmm. But, you know, relationships, they can be unstable. They can break up people. Pass, you know, it's, it's like we really want to put all the eggs of our happiness in the basket of a relationship. Well, and even if you, know? you are, I mean, I can speak for myself, like being in a, you know, I've been married for 35 years and I am <laughs> working on you know, creating as we head towards retirement, we're not retiring now, but just creating a sense of space and autonomy within this relationship as I move forward into something new, right? Like it's like, it doesn't have to be like, we're going to do every little thing together. It's going to be like, how am I going to keep myself happy and fiercely compassionate towards my own needs? 
Right, right. And, and it's a big thing for women because we're so socialized to get our value from people liking us and improving us Ooh. of us and helping them and you know, to be nice. And, yes. you know, and it, it, it's, uh, it, it hinders us. It hinders our happiness. It hinders our authenticity and our fulfillment. So much. But here, here's the thing. Why, it's, it's not like we have to reject kindness to get there. We have to harness kindness to get there. That's the cool thing. Mm -hmm. You know, we aren't like saying, okay, we're going to forget being kind. We're just going to be selfish. (laughs) Not that at all. It's really just including ourselves in the circle of kindness. And when we do that, we actually have a lot more to give to others. So it's win-win. It is. It really, really, truly is. Because as you said at the very beginning, if we're showing up more authentically, so understanding our needs, advocating for our own needs, along with being kind to ourselves and others, like yeah. that's a better place to come from than resentment or hurt or yes. feeling, I don't know, neglected. And yes, unseen. exactly. Exactly. And also just in terms of the burnout, I mean, burnout, especially after this pandemic, the, the oh. burnout levels are through the roof. Yes. You know, one of the things that's been very well established in the research is self-compassion reduces burnout, the ability mm. to care for yourself, whether that's physical self-care or even more importantly, emotional care, yeah. dealing with all the pain and distress of feelings of burnt out and exhausted. The more of that you can give yourself, you know, the more it helps others. Yeah. One of the skills that you taught in the retreat that I participated in was the, and I'm not remembering what it was called, but when you're with another who is struggling you know, breathing in compassion for yes. yourself, breathing yes. out compassion for them. That yeah. that helps me in session. That helps me with yes. difficult relationships. That's been right. an incredibly powerful tool. Yes, good. Yeah, that's in that's in the the caregiving chapter of my new book. That practice. yes, yeah. it's really yeah, it's really helpful. Yeah, especially when you're in the profession of being a yeah therapist or whatever. Yeah. So would you be willing to guide us in one of the more fierce self-compassion exercises? So this is a version of what in the in self-compassion training, we call the self-compassion break, which is kind of like put, pushing the reset button on the computer when you're mm. frozen up with like dismay or fear or a lot of intense emotions. It actually is a way you can intentionally bring in the three components of self-compassion to the situation to help. Mm -hmm. And so when your goal is to protect yourself in some way or to stand up for yourself or draw boundaries, remember the three components of kindness, common humanity, and mindfulness manifest as brave and powered clarity. Mm. So this is actually a practice that's going to help us try to call up for a real situation, some bravery, some feelings of empowerment, and some real clarity, right? Okay. Okay. So you may, you may want to close your eyes as you're doing this practice. I always find it helps to go in when you close your eyes. Mm-hmm. So maybe just settling into your body, taking a few deep breaths. Feeling your feet connected to the ground, kind of ground and stabilize yourself. And also during this practice, if at any moment, you, you know, something comes up, a memory, and it starts to be overwhelming, please take care of yourself. You may need to open your eyes or, or just feel your feet touching the floor. Just make sure you monitor your own safety and stability. Mm-hmm. Okay, so I'd actually invite you to think of a situation in your life right now where you, where you feel you do need to protect yourself in some way. Like maybe you need to draw some boundaries. Maybe there's someone who's trying to get involved where you don't want them to be, maybe a relative or someone pushing their political views on you, something like that. Or maybe, you know, you feel like you need to speak up. Maybe you're unhappy with something that's happening at work and you'd really like to speak up, protect yourself in that way. Or maybe you feel you're being treated unfairly in some way. Right. So just just see what comes to mind. Please don't choose a situation where you actually feel really afraid or even traumatized, because if we get overwhelmed, you're not actually going to be able to learn the practice. If you feel overwhelmed, just something where you feel you need to build that fierce mama bear energy. Again, so drawing boundaries, maybe saying no to someone, speaking up. Okay, so just really call the situation to mind. And if you can, try not to focus too much on any 
particular person or maybe group of people who are causing the situation. Try not to make it too personal if you can. See if you can really focus on what is the threat or what is the boundary violation? What is the potential harm? So really try to focus on what's happening, not so much about who's causing it because then that can lead us in another direction. So really what's happening? And then also just what's happening in you, right? What's coming up for you? Is it again, fear, anger, frustration, sadness maybe, worry? Okay, and then as much as possible, really try to, especially when thinking about your own emotions, See if you can really drop into your body in the sense that you get in touch with any physical sensations you're having. Maybe it's tension in your throat or your stomach or just overall sense of uneasiness. Get in touch with your body. So now please try allowing your body to really uh, manifest a sense of uh, strength and determination. So sitting, sitting uh, straight, Right, with your back straight, head held high, maybe rolling your shoulders back. Right, so your body is really feeling empowered by the way you're sitting. And then saying a series, we're gonna, we're gonna be doing the saying a series of phrases to yourself and you can say them aloud or just silently to yourself that are really designed to bring in these three components self-compassion and their active protective form. And right, we'll try to help you find language that works for you. So the first thing we wanna do is bring in some mindfulness, right? So mindfulness manifests as real clarity. We wanna be very clear about what's happening. So maybe saying to yourself something like, you know, I really see what's happening and it's not okay, right? Or maybe, I don't feel I'm being treated justly. Or, you know, I don't want to say yes. Or, you know, you're crossing a boundary, right? So some just clear articulation of what's happening. So we're kind of validating it. We're calling attention to it. Again, using whatever words feel right to you. And then we wanna remind ourselves of our connection to others, right? You know, and the power that's found in this connection. So reminding yourself something, of saying something like, you know, I am not alone in this. Right? In other words, you aren't just a solitary individual. There are many, many other people going through similar situations as you, right? So you might wanna say something like, you know, I'm not alone or it's not just me, or maybe just me too, hmm. <laughs> you know, or maybe something more like, you know, all human beings deserve just and fair treatment. By standing up for myself, I'm standing up for everyone. Right? Whatever, whatever. So see what feels right for you, but some language, it really um, reminds you of the fact that you are connected to others. You know, it is more than just you. Okay. And then now what I'd invite you to do is maybe put like a fist over your heart, a fist that symbolizes um, strength and bravery, right? It's kind of a, an act of commitment of strength. And try saying some words that give you courage, something like, I will be brave. You know, I will stand up for myself. Uh, you know, I'll I'll do what I have to to protect myself. Just, just again, whatever language really speaks to you, to, to formulate a resolve and a determination to protect yourself. Maybe it's just stop. Hmm. 
And if you're feeling a little lost about what to say, you, you may imagine like, what would you say to a really good friend? Maybe was, I don't know, being bullied at work or something was happening. What words might you say to your friend to really try to empower them, to give them strength and determination? That might be a, a source of the language you might try with yourself. And then finally, I'd invite you to put a hand over your fist. You've got your fist here, but you also have a hand held, uh, held your fist tenderly. Right. In other words, what we're going to try to do is combine this uh, fierce energy of brave, empowered clarity with some of the tender energy of loving, connected presence. Right. So we kind of we want to be able to feel our force, our power, maybe even anger, but we also want to make sure that it that force is caring, that it's loving. Right. So see if you can allow these two energies of the fierceness and tenderness to merge within you. Right. And so again, our, our intent is to prevent harm. We don't wanna cause harm by harming other people, even maybe the people who are doing this. We want to prevent harm. This is actually a, an act of love. Just see if you can allow that to be so. Allow your, your fierceness to be loving. Okay, and so you can open your eyes now. And, and, and sometimes it is activating. So if you're feeling very activated, there's a couple of things you can do. You can uh, just feel your feet grounded to the floor, like let Mother Earth take it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> if you have a lot of energy, you can kind of just ground it to the earth. Or you may need to like have a cup of tea or take a little walk or something like that. Yeah. But that's the basic idea. So we, we just call forward the three components and whatever and really whatever form they need to take in the moment to be helpful. And that, that's going to look different depending on what your situation is. Yeah. Yeah. But such a powerful exercise to even if it's silently giving yourself voice to yes. defend yourself, but to speak up in a way, as you said, to not to harm others, but to bring healing and yes. love and compassion to a difficult situation. And, and to prevent harm to yourself. Absolutely. <laughs> well, count, absolutely. You know? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And to protect yeah. yourself. Yes. Most yeah. importantly. Yes. Yeah. Well, and, and as you were <sighs> guiding us, I was thinking, you know, that that protective, you know, protecting ourselves and preventing harm in a, you know, in a kind way, even fierce kind way is also a loving gesture to others to say like, I, I don't deserve this, but I want yeah. you to know that I see it I, and I, yeah, and it's not okay. Yeah. And you also give other people permission to do the same, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Especially your, your, especially other women and you say no, Yeah, you're kind of giving other women permission to also say no. Yeah, that is a great, great point. Good modeling, right? Yeah. <laughs> yes, exactly. So yeah. thank you so much. I, I appreciate your uh, leading us in that uh, meditation skill. And that was super You're great. You're welcome. So I want people to know how they can find you and find your new book, Fierce Self-Compassion, How Women Can Harness Kindness and Speak Up. Yeah. Yes. Well, it's out June 15th. It's just you can do any, any, any bookseller, online bookseller. Um, and if you want to learn more about fear, self-compassion or, or do more practices, uh, just you can go to my website, selfcompassion.org. Spell it anyway. <laughs> uh, all roads lead to my website. I've, I was in there so long. So you can go to my website and I've, I've created a new fear, self-compassion page, but I have a lot of practices and exercises and it's really a free resource. Um, a lot of free awesome. resources and a good, nice place to start. Well, Kristen, yeah. thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for taking time out of, I'm sure, a busy schedule and motherhood and all of that. And thanks for being on the podcast. Oh, thanks so much for having me. This week's episode is brought to you by three invitations to come home to you. We all have different parts or voices we hear that can influence how we act, 
how we feel, and how we engage with the world. When we can get curious and learn more about all of our parts with compassion, we begin to feel more at home in ourselves. I'd like to invite you to explore some of your parts with the three invitations to come home to you. When you sign up, you'll gain access to the prompts that will be your guide to help you get to know you and your parts a little bit better. To get access to your prompts and find out more about working one-on-one with me, go to elizabethcushcoaching.com. That was so great. She was so easy to talk to, and I really enjoyed sharing this time with Kristen Neff on the podcast. And I hope you did too. I hope you were able to take away some nuggets from that conversation. And I just want to say that this was a personal highlight of the podcast for me. I have been a big, I, I want to say fan, which sounds weird, but I have really adopted so much of the self-compassion practices into my life and my therapy practice and my coaching business. So to have her here talking about her book was just super great. And I am so excited that I get to share that with you. So I hope you will go out and buy her book. It'll be available June 15th. Again, it's called Fierce Self-Compassion, How Women Can Harness Kindness to Speak Up, Claim Their Power, and Thrive. I really enjoyed the guided practice that she led us through. If stuff came up for you, if it did activate you, just know that is normal. That is not unusual. Not everyone will have that experience, but it's not unusual. And that some of the practices that I read while uh, reading her book did activate some of my stuff because I've shared how hard anger and standing up for myself and finding my voice has been. And just know, again, it's a practice be kind to yourself along the way, and take care of yourself in all of it. I hope that you all have a fiercely compassionate week. I hope that you take care of yourself and honor your needs and speak up for yourself and others when needed. Have a wonderful week. Ciao for now from This Woman Warrior. Thanks for listening to today's episode of Woman Warriors Podcast. The information in this podcast is not a substitute for seeking help from a licensed mental health professional. Music was written and performed by Andy Cush. If you'd like more information on this episode, you can find the show notes, the resources shared today, and links to the guest profiles at womanwarriors.com.